continuing on because it has been incredibly uh, anointed by the Lord to do pastor's favorites, and I picked one this morning. Uh, it's entitled, Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. And some of you are looking at your pants to see if they're on fire already. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Again, it's more of a teaching message. Uh, uh, it'll... it'll speak to everyone in here because I believe we're living in an age of lies. I mean, you don't know what to believe anymore. You don't know who to trust anymore. If you don't trust someone, that means really you don't believe it. And uh, you don't trust the media. And you're just like me. I don't trust the media either. I don't trust newspapers. Uh, I don't trust certain people that are masquerading around trying to preach uh, what they call the gospel, and it's not really the gospel. Uh, I don't. I believe there's there's only one gospel, and that's Jesus and Him risen, crucified at the right hand of the Father for you and me. It's certainly not a gospel of good works. It's a gospel of grace. And um, I want to share with you this morning, uh, liar, liar, pants on fire. Of course, we're talking about Satan. And uh, I got a clip that I want to use. It's really not a visual. It's an audio clip. Uh, the visual doesn't really do much, um, and I had to, to go this route. How many of you remember Paul Harvey? How many enjoyed Paul Harvey? Yeah, it was something you look forward to. It, it, almost every day we would have a local uh, radio show. Even here in Houston, there was one where I grew up. There was one. Uh, around noon, there would be the news, and Paul Harvey was always um, around noon time, and he would tell this story, and he would enlighten you with the better part of it, and then he would sign off with good day. In 1965, Paul Harvey did one of his most famous readings on the radio. It caught the nation by storm, and it was one of the most requested, repeated airings of Paul Harvey, and it was entitled, If I Were the Devil. I want you to listen to this. Again, he read it in 1965. You're talking about prophetic. I want you to listen to this and apply it to where we're at today, and then I'll come back and I'll talk to you about liar, liar, pants on fire. You can clap for the clip. <laughs> But isn't that prophetic? I mean, he wasn't a Bible scholar. He wasn't someone that went to seminary. He was someone that just saw things as they were. I want you to understand, in John chapter number 8, and that'll be where I take my text from, verse number 44, Jesus is speaking to a group of his kinsmen, and he, they're religious there are a lot of people that are religious in the world, but they're not born again. They don't have a relationship with a Heavenly Father. They're religious because they feel they're morally right in what they believe. And they believe their opinion is the opinion that matters the most. And thus, they're religious. They're cautious about some moral things, but they all have an agenda. You don't have an agenda when you're trying to please God. And Jesus is speaking to the this group of people, and he says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And again, I want to validate, Satan speaks no truth. Any truth that he speaks is half-truth, and half-truth is really a lie. And when he lies, he speaks, talking about Satan, his own language or his own native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Satan is the father of lies in that he is the original liar. He, he is the one that lied in the very beginning. You could almost say he invented the lie. And the lie promotes a feeling sometimes of uh, peace and calm in our life because when we lie, when we're in trouble, we think we're going to get a, a temporary uh, I guess, omission of the guilt that we should feel. But let me just say this. Your lies will catch up to you. Scripture says, be sure and know this, that your sin will find you out. So he's the father of lies. It's important. Satan 
told the first lie and recorded history to Eve in the Garden of Eden. After planting seeds of doubt in Eve's mind with a question, in Genesis 3.1, it's important, he directly contradicts God's word by telling her, you will not surely die, in Genesis 3.4. With that lie, Satan led Eve to her death, and Adam followed, and so have we all. Everyone in here is guilty of lying. And this is not a message about us lying. It's a message about the father of lies who makes the lies or the things that he wants us to accomplish look so attractive that we lie to ourselves and we will participate in what the world does and then we lie this way. This is how Christians lie because this is what we say. We say we have no sin and we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if the truth is not in us, that means there's falsehood in us. And that means we're living a lie because we're supposed to live a certain way. Can I get an amen? We're supposed to live a certain way, and when we don't, we are actually living a lie when we live contradictory to what we're supposed to. And Satan, the lying is Satan's primary weapon against God's children. He uses the tactic of deceit to separate people from their heavenly Father. Some of his more common lies is this. There is no God. God doesn't care about you. The Bible can not be trusted, and your good works and being a good person will get you into heaven. The Apostle Paul tells us that Satan runs around or masquerades as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, So that what he says and what he does sounds good and seems reasonable, but nothing else is even close to the truth about what he says. Many of Satan's lies tend to perpetuate themselves. Have you ever known a person who was a liar and then they tell another lie to make the lie look better? And then they continue to tell the lie and they start believing their own lie. Some people will make up stories and the story sounds so good that it perpetuates itself and you continue to build on it. It's important that you understand that you have to be careful with that because you'll live in a state of not being true to who you really are. When you live with this falsehood, they perpetuate themselves and people today are still used to spread lies for him. Often he uses false teachings and people and falsehoods and in the case of false religions and cults, he uses that to spread his lies also. Because see, people want to be religious. God's not interested in religious people. The one that Jesus was talking to was religious people in John chapter 8 verse 44. Matter of fact, they were the most religious people of their day. They tried to keep rules, they tried to keep regulations, and they would check the box. But Jesus said if you break one of the rules or one issue of the law, you've broken it all. In other words, you and I cannot keep the law, we cannot keep a bunch of religious rules, and God's not interested in rules. God is wanting relationship with us. And the relationship comes by believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. And Satan wants to deter you away from that. He wants to make things look good, sound good. By the way, there are two roads that lead to heaven. And Satan never marks his road that says road to hell. There's a broad road and there's many on it that the scripture says. And then there's a narrow road and there'd be few that be there on it. It's like a turnstile. If you use the Greek language to interpret that text, it would tell you like a single entrance. In other words... The road to heaven is one person at a time. It's not universal. People are not going to heaven because God is good. People are going to heaven because they have received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. When I say Lord and Savior, not just saved from hell, but He is your Lord in how you live your life. He is the consciousness of who we have. So Satan's tactics work. Satan has told more lies to more people and even angels than any being ever created. His success depends on on people believing his lies. He will be a failure if you don't believe his lies. He is important in his own eyes. He is the prince and power of the air. You need to understand that. And he's used everything from little white lies to huge pants on fire lies. Everybody says, oh, it's just a little white lie, but if we're not careful... As the Bible uses this analogy, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. If you learn that a white lie will get you out of trouble, you'll certainly learn in that principle that if a little lie will help you, imagine what a big lie will do. You have to stay true to yourselves. 
Adolf Hitler was a man who learned how to lie effectively. And he once said, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequent enough, it will be believed. Politicians are really good at this. I don't know about you, and I'm not trying to be political, but I heard the State of the Union. I never heard more lies in my life. Can I get an amen? Like a lying dog we got up in Washington, amen? And all of his cronies clapping every time he'd tell a lie. And they'd stand up telling a lie, telling a lie, or a half-truth, or not the whole truth. I was so angry when I heard that. I was driving in a car back from my grandson's ball game, and I was all over the road. I was running people off the road, I so had. I couldn't believe it. Brother, a lie, small or large, is not really the issue. The father of lies wants us to lie. This is not even a message telling you not to lie. This is a message to show you how Satan lies. I'm going to give you five things. Now, he tells a ton of lies. There's so many lies. So where do I start? There's so many lies. Here's some some lies that, that are frequent and they hit all of us. How many of you have been told by Satan in your spirit, in your heart, you're not good enough? How many have ever heard in yourself or even told yourself you're not good enough? Because let me just say this. Satan will speak into your mind so much that you'll start talking to your own self, repeating what he says. You might not tell it to other people, but you'll tell it to yourself. You'll say, I'm not good enough. But see, the Bible says, God says, you're beautifully and wonderfully made. You were created in the image of God. How can you not be good enough? Jesus Christ went to the cross for you. And it wasn't because you were good, it was because you were not good. And every one of us will never be good enough because it's a relative term. So Satan will tell us that we're not good enough. He'll tell us that we're not pretty or handsome enough. We'll walk around in bondage all the time. All you got to do is look at Facebook, how people are trying to overcome that with falsehoods they put on their their picture, their pouts, their... By the way, I I, I don't think I've ever said anything about this, and I'm I'm not against anybody looking good. I think you need to look as good as you can. But I think there's an extreme. When you wear eyes, just a little like horse's tails. So there's got to be a long grind somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? I see people and I can't even see their eyes because their eyelashes are like out to here. If they had to wear glasses, it would be like windshield wipers in, inside their glasses. And they're plucking their lips to where it looks like they're wearing hot dogs on their mouths. You know, I, I don't understand I, I, I don't understand it. But see, in reality, what we're doing is we're altering truth. There, there's a limit to what everyone should do when it comes to making themselves look good. And I think the key with looking good, ladies, let me just say this, is a godly appearance with modesty that brings honor and glory to who you are and to your Heavenly Father. And you guys, the rules are pretty much the same for you too. Amen. So we're not pretty enough, or we're not good enough, or we're not smart enough. Satan uses all of these things. Or you're a bad person. God can't love you. You'll never make it to heaven because you're so bad. Heaven's going to be full of bad people. Matter of fact, every person in heaven at one time was bad. The Bible says there's none good. No, not one. So if you're not good, what are you? Let me try that again. If you're not good, what are you? Yeah, and left on your own, you're never going to make heaven because you'll never be good enough because it's not based on being good. It's based on having a relationship and believing and trusting in God who says, I'll love you as you are. You don't have to do any false makeup. You don't have to, you know, paint the barn in multiple stages, and you don't have to alter this and lift that and group that and take this and do that. You don't have to do that for me to love you. Isn't that good love? Someone who accepts us as we are and even describes us as beautifully and wonderfully made in His image. And He knows us before we're ever born and nothing we do shocks Him and He still loves us. That's unconditional love. It's not about a relationship. Bad people are going to be in heaven. Some will say, you're not, you're, you're not worth anything. Parents, be careful how you tell your kids harsh words like they'll never amount to anything or they're not worth anything because some people today struggle so much with self-esteem because all they heard when they were little is they weren't worth anything. Be sure to compliment your kids. Be truthful with it. So it's important as Christians we are in a warfare 
against Satan. It is a warfare. It's a battle for the mind. It really is. And while it is true Jesus defeated Satan on the cross, it's also true that Satan never ceases to attack on God's people. Jesus defeated Satan on the cross when he said, Take us died, it's finished, and I'll get to that before I'm done. But we are in a constant battle with our minds and, and with defining who we are. There has to be a point in time in everyone's life that they have a come-to-Jesus meeting. And I didn't steal that from the after effects of a State of the Union message that we overheard our president talking about how that I'm going to tell Israel how to do what they need to do. You leave Israel alone and Israel will be fine. They know how to fight. And they know what God promised them. And what happens is we lose sight of the fact that Jesus defeated Satan on the cross, but he never ceases his attack on God's people. Unfortunately, we're not God in the flesh. And our flesh and our mind will constantly bombard us. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says this, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. There are people, and Satan is trying because he will blind the eyes of those, uh, and he calls them the God of this age. He'll blind their minds who do not believe because he doesn't want you to see the light of God. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen it says, And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into that angel of light. Satan doesn't come to you with a long tail, pitchfork, and horns. That's a lie of itself. He created that lie. He wanted to mar the image to where it becomes comic book type fear. He wanted himself to maybe become one of these comic book type of characters. Satan transforms himself as an angel of light. He's got, his name in the Hebrew is Hallel. Hallel means shining one. He was beautiful when he rolled in heaven. Why do you... He doesn't take an image of being ugly here. He comes as an angel of light. Everything he says is, is enticing. It's deceptive. It's good. But it's a lie. It is a lie. And if there's any truth, and many half-truths are being preached from pulpits all over uh, the world today, and a half-truth is not real truth. Some people say, man, you can have your best life when you find self-esteem and you really find out how good life is. Life should be good. It should be the abundant life. But it's not based on you being good. It's based on you finding God. And he said, when they come to me, I'll give them the abundant life. Not just life, but life more abundantly. You will live the good life. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you this morning just five things that I feel are important from the liar, liar, pants on fire. And by the way, his pants are on fire right now. He's going to burn in hell. Satan doesn't win. Let me just say this. He's a defeated foe. He is a defeated foe. But he's believed his own lies, and he thinks he's going to win, but he continues to do. And by the way, he has no power over God. God, he's a created being that God swept out of heaven, and he's the prince and power of this air. I know he took one-third of the angels with him, but he lied to them also. Because in his own lie, he said, I'll be like God. And yet they chose to follow him as he had the influence. And you know where his influence came from? Music. He influenced them with deceiving words and words. Those I'm talking about the angels in heaven. You've got to be careful what you listen to. You've got to be careful what you watch. You've got to be careful what you read. And you say, well, it's all this stuff about books in school and this being taught and that. You know why? Because it changes the focus of who you really are. There is an agenda out there to change the real us, to change the real you, and to change your children. Not a political message, but it's part of the lying system. Lie number one. Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. The lie number one that I believe is super important. Satan tells us that God withholds good things from us. A lot of people don't want to follow Christ or don't want to be, become a Christian because they think that they'll have to give up everything that's good. I didn't have to give up anything to follow Christ. I didn't have to give up anything. I said, I used the word have to. There was no mandate me uh, to me to give up anything. There was nothing there. When I made the decision to follow Christ, it was based on nothing more than His love for me and Him dying for me, and me recognizing that I was a sinner. See, the real me had to recognize that I was a sinner. 
because I was created in God's image, and anything contrary to God makes me a sinner. When Satan entered in and Eve ate of the apple, sin entered into the world, and guess what? I was born into sin. And I had to identify the real me that I was a sinner. Every one of you who got saved, the first aspect in salvation is that you had to identify that of being a sinner, but you didn't have to give up anything. Not a single person gave up anything when they came to Jesus Christ to be saved. It's not based on what you give up. It's based on how much you trust Him. See, the things that I gave up are not the things that I had to give up. They're the things I wanted to give up. I wanted to give them up because I realized that in God's Word, there were some things that I was might have been doing, saying, thinking, or participating in that wasn't God's plan. But I didn't have to give it up. I wanted to give it up. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The lie of the devil is this. God's going to withhold all these good things, so why do you want to follow a God who doesn't want you to have anything, doesn't want you to have fun, doesn't want you to do this? And see, uh, in Genesis 3, 4, and 5, Then the serpent said unto the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. He lied to her. Satan tempts us into believing God's goodness obligates him to gratify our immediate desires. They sing a song just in the set, a good, good father. God is a good God. The Bible says in the book of James, every good gift that comes down comes down from above, from the Father of lights that opens your eyes. It's all good that comes down from the Father. Christians, let me just say this. Some of you are struggling so hard to keep rules and regulations, you're not really living. You're existing. God wants you to live in the fullness of who He is. God wants you to live in the light that He's given you and, and to identify yourself with Him. Once you quit fighting with the flesh and trying to identify who you really are and you yield yourself to Him, you'll be shocked at the peace of God that comes upon your life, the joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, how He'll supply all of your need according to His riches and glory. See, Satan tempts us to believe God's goodness obligates Him to gratify our immediate desires. In other words, we ask God for things, and if we don't get them, we think God withholds them. How many of you ever prayed in the flesh? You might have prayed it privately. God, I really would like to have that new house. God, I'd really like to have that new car. God, I want a lake house. God, I want a new boat. And all of those things are great. I want them too. I'd love to have. I had a lake house. I sold it. I had alligators. I prayed to eat my kids. So I had to sell it. But see, Satan will tell you that God is obligated to you to give you what you ask for, what you want, and if you don't get what you want, proves that God is not real. God is not obligated to give us anything. There's no obligation there about our wants. Philippians 4, 19, And my God shall supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. See, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel says that you can have everything that you want. You just ask God for it and He'll give it to you. There's some things that God doesn't want you to have because He knows you can't be a good steward of what you got right now. And see, we're talking about, the Scripture says that He'll supply all your need, not all of your wants. A lot of people are talking to God and asking for this and asking for that, and it's not about a want. I promise you, when you define the new you, the real you, the person you're supposed to be, and don't believe the lie of the devil, you will find that what God wants you to have, you'll be content with. And God will give you more than you ever thought you'd ever have. And you don't even have to ask for it. Do you think that God doesn't know what you need? Do you think God doesn't know the desire of your heart? The Bible says in the book of Psalms, delight yourself in the Lord. And He'll give you what? The desire of your heart. You'll get it. And you don't have to ask for it. God's plan plans are always aimed at our best over the long haul. I would challenge you. I would challenge you to tell me one good thing God has withheld from you. You're really going to have to think hard. And most of you will say, I can't think of anything that God has ever withheld. One good thing. Because here's the thing. Everything that I have, He's given to me. He's given every, everything that I have, He's given to me. My house, my wife, 
See, here's a new perspective. Guys, when you understand that God put you and her together, you'll look at her differently. And lady, you'll look at him differently. God put you together, and then he makes a statement, and let no man take it apart. Right? You become one flesh. But see, we start thinking God withholds good things from us. And he doesn't. That's a lie of the devil. God wants you to have everything that your hearts desire. But you've got to be patient and let God work through you. Phyllis and I are amazed. I mean, we are truly, truly amazed. As we look, I've been pastoring her for 40 years, a long time, preaching, teaching the Word of God. Not out making a bunch of money, not, not, not following what I originally thought I would do. Uh, I mean, I had the ability to make money. I was, I was very good at it. I could make a lot of money, but I found out one thing. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but but we just we just are amazed at what how God has blessed us. And you don't make a lot of money if you're in ministry of a church our size. You make a great living, and this church takes very good care of us. But we don't make millions of dollars. You can look us up, and you won't find that we make twenty five, thirty million, and we're our net worth not ten million dollars, and. We don't ask people to mail in money, so we'll pray for them. You want? We don't ask people to plant a seed and do this. We don't do that. We don't. We don't believe in that junk because that's a lie too. We don't believe that. We believe that the Holy Spirit. I look at the scriptural premise, and I don't find anybody that was really preaching the gospel, going out begging for money or asking for more money. They were trusting God, and that's what we've done. We trusted God, and we sometimes we we were driving around yesterday, and we just we were just absolutely amazed how God has blessed. And we didn't ask for it. We didn't ask for it. We didn't say, Lord, give me the big house. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me this. Lord, this is what I covet. This is what I'd really like to have. Da, 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 da. We didn't ask for anything. You know what we did? We just said, Lord, let us be faithful. Let us be faithful. But see, Satan wants to tell all of us God withholds all the good stuff from us. Lie number two. Lie number two. Satan wants you to trust in the deity of self. He wants you to be your own God. He wants you to be higher than God. He'll let you believe in God. He'll let you believe in God. He'll let you quote some scripture. He'll let you attend his church. But when it comes to really ruling your life, he'll want you to overrule what the God of heaven says and the God of self will take over. I know. I've done it. And it was not good for me. When you try to rationalize yourself and the way you're living your life outside the realm of what God says, you have now made yourself a God. And even in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other God before me. Psalms 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord. Why did Solomon write this? Because so many trust in themselves. You trust in what you do. There's some of you are trusting. You've got hard decisions to make, and you're trusting yourself right now instead of trusting in the Lord. And again, Satan wants you to trust in the deity of self, the God of self. And see, the biggest letter in sin is in the middle, and it's S-I-N. It's I. We start trusting in ourselves. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct your path. There's some of you that need to be praying right now for God to direct your path, and you need to learn to trust Him and quit quit trying to do it all yourself. Matter of fact, I, I, this, this one in the chart, if you've got a, a tough day, I'm just going to stop right here. I'm not going to stop with a message, but I just think I need to, right now, if there's somebody right now that is facing a hard decision, and you're praying, and, and you're having difficulty trusting God. It's a natural thing. We do. We have difficulty letting go when it comes to difficult things. And you'd like for me to pray for you? I don't want to wait to the end. I'd rather pray for you right now. If you're, if you're going through something very difficult, and you're finding it hard to trust in God, and, and, and you're finding that, that you're making all the decisions, just quickly stand up. I want to pray for you right now. One, right there. Two, right there. Is there another? Three, four, five. Look at this. Hard decisions right now. Why do you want to wait to the end of service? Just right now, let me pray for you that trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't try to lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He'll direct your paths. I promise you, the Word of God is true. God will direct your paths right now. 
right now. You don't need to wait for there's some music and an invitation. God has already spoken to your heart. I want to pray for you right now. Please, church, pray with me. Father, I pray for every person standing right now. I pray that they'd not override who you are. I pray they'd not take you off the throne. I pray they'd not to rob you of all your power, all your glory, all your sovereignty, all your grace, all your goodness. I pray, Father, that they would understand that you're a good, good God and that you're in control and that you know everything about them. And, Father, I pray right now that you would give them the strength and the wisdom to trust you. I, would, I pray that you bring to their, their remembrance how many times that you, you were put to the test and they put you to the test and, and you never failed. How many times you have brought them through. How many times you have spoken to their heart. How many times, Lord, I just want to pray for their courage, their strength, their, their mental state, their spiritual state. And Father, more than anything, I want to rebuke Satan. I want to rebuke Satan right now, telling them that they got the answers. And, Father, I pray that they'd seek your will in the, whatever they're struggling with, whatever thing they're going through, whether it be health, finances, relationship, a career change. I don't know what it is, a spiritual change. But, Father, I pray they trust you right now. We rebuke Satan. We rebuke him by the authority of the Word of God. We rebuke him because he's a liar and there's no truth in him. And like Jesus says... He's the father of lies. Father, I just thank you that there is nothing that you cannot do. There is nothing that you cannot do in the lives of your people. For this simple fact, we can trust you because you cannot lie. You cannot lie. It'd be contradicted to who you are. So, Father, I claim victory for every person standing right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I know it's unusual. Give the Lord a hand clap. That's good. Why do you got to wait to be set free? Why don't you, I, I, I didn't plan on doing it, the Lord said. But see, I think sometimes the, the, the deity of self gets in our way. Satan tempts us to trust in, in, in the worldly things, like in First Chronicles 21 1, when the David wanted to, uh, uh, Saul wanted to count the people. God said, Don't worry about that. Don't worry about numbers. Don't worry about what's going on. Just trust me. Philippians 4 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, see, when you're believing the lie of the devil and the devil's telling you that you are smarter than God because you know how to live, you don't need nobody, you don't need no preacher to tell you anything. You know, you don't need that Pastor Mike down there brainwashing y'all. You know, how does he know everything in that book is true? I tell you how, the Spirit's revealed it to me. I lived through it. I, I Look, I, I, there are things that I struggled with in the book. But then when I started to live through them, I no longer struggled with them because I saw that they were true. I saw that they were effective. There are 7,000 promises in that book that are given for me to cling to. That's why I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Satan wants us to fall victim of the old lie of self-reliance. Self-reliance. When the Bible says in Philippians 4, 19, that my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. Lie number three. Still with me now, say amen. Lie number three is this, and there are so many lies he could tell, but I believe these, you, you know, uh, there are a lot of people that attend churches, they get, make a profession of faith, and then after a month or two or some difficulty come, you don't see them anymore. You don't see them anymore. Now, there's either two options. Option number one, they were never saved or born again to begin with. That's a real option. Can I get an amen? Option number two, Satan has entered in and got them to believe a lie. And they're so discouraged, they don't know what to do anymore. And it is part of our human nature to get discouraged. It is part of our human nature to have anxiety. It's part of our human nature to withdraw. It's part of our human nature to run and hide. We find great characters in the Bible that ran and hide because of anxiety. I can tell you David did it, Elijah did it, Elijah, Elijah was part of calling fire down from heaven, and he's, a woman puts her finger in his face, and he gets all scared and wants to run. It can happen to the best of us. It certainly can. We can find Peter, who was the leader of all the disciples, the protoss, the Greek word for the, the natural leader, the protoss disciple. He was the one of importance. And yet we find he got so discouraged, afraid, and scared of public pressure that he denied the Lord, even being a follower of Christ. And here's the lie, number three. 
God's people will never suffer. Satan will tell you that you will never suffer if you become a Christian. And that's a lie. Because he knows the minute you start suffering, and if you believe that lie, you don't want to be a Christian any longer. You'll say, I didn't suffer before being a Christian. Everything was good. This health issue didn't come in my life when I was out doing my own thing. And you'll get discouraged. Now, either you won't be saved or you believe the lie of the devil. Let me tell you what Matthew 16, 21 through 23 says. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Why? He's going to be crucified. And suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And be killed and raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, here is Peter trying to tell the Lord of glory... God in the flesh, that I don't care what you believe, Lord, this ain't going to happen to you. And I want you to understand that God uses people to speak negative things into your life that will discourage you. Peter is rebuking the Lord when the Lord says, I'm going to have to go suffer many things. And they're going to kill me. And they don't want to hear it. But let me just tell you this. Here's the real truth. When you become a Christian, you're going to suffer a lot of things. You're going to suffer, suffer rejection. You're, you're going to you're going to you're going to suffer maybe a family splitting apart. You're going to suffer alienation. You are going to suffer so many things. Your health may deteriorate as a test of your faith. You may lose a job because you don't fit a certain agenda anymore. You can't speak the peace or the or the real truth. And Peter rebukes him. He pulls him aside began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. In other words, Satan was speaking through Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. And you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. In other words, Peter was allowing Satan... To alter what God had said when Jesus said, i got to go and suffer many things. And see, people who become a Christian and all of a sudden negativity comes into their life and they have to suffer a little bit. You wouldn't, you, I could write a list a mile long of things that we've had to suffer following Christ. I'm talking about just health issues. Nobody's omitted from that. I've been preaching for 40 years. I was diagnosed with cancer. My wife's had a heart attack. She's actually, to be honest, she's a walking miracle. She have died from Atascacita to the hospital. I mean, a miracle. Only had a, I don't even know if I had more than two gallons of gas, and I was afraid to stop. All I did was cover her heart with my hand and pray, God, keep her alive, we'll get there. Walking miracle. She had brain surgery. She had compound fracture of her ankle. Nobody is... is omitted from suffering a little bit from the difficulties that come. We've had our issues in our family. It seems like Satan's attacking all the time. But let me just say this. The more Satan attacks, the greater God's glory is. The more that seems to come against us, the more we overcome. The, the, all the negatives in life, see, I'm not going to believe the lie of the devil. I'm going to believe that God is still on the throne. God is still a miracle-working God. God still hears my prayers, and God still has got me in His hand, and nobody's going to pluck me from His hand. And I'm going to be like Job. Though He slay me, I will not curse Him. And though my friends come and tell me a bunch of lies and call me a sinner and everything else, I'm going to rebuke them in the name of the Lord. And I might have to sit in ashes and sit with... With, with, and, and mourn, but I can promise you this, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. No matter what happens, God is on the throne. The Peter's mindset was this, nothing bad's going to happen when you're a follower of Jesus. And if something's going on in your life, don't you be discouraged this morning. First Peter 4 says, Beloved, Peter got it right, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceedingly joy. You know the one thing that the greatest Christian we probably have ever seen? Here's, here's Paul's prayer. How many of you agree with Paul? Probably one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. 
writes 14 books in the New Testament. Brilliant scholar. Gives us all these great doctrinal truths to follow. You want to read how he was persecuted, what he went through? It's a long list. It's a long list. And Paul said this, here's the one thing that I really want to do. I want to know to the extent. I want to know, this is how he described it, the power of his suffering. I want to know the power of his suffering. And then what it does when he suffers the power of the resurrection. In other words, every time Paul went through a difficult thing, God always brought him through. Every time Jesus suffered, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Can you imagine? Paul said, I want to know that. I want to experience that. I don't want to live a normal life. I, I am glad that God can put certain things on us. I remember when I got cancer, Phyllis and I, we were, were shocked. I maybe wept a little bit that first day. And then I just said this, Lord, let me handle this in a way that would be pleasing to you. Let me teach other people how to stand when difficulty comes into their life. Let me let me show them. Give me the grace to do it. Give me the joy to do it. And boy, did he ever bring me through. Diagnosed one month, next month, gone. I'm in year number seven. Praise God. Amen. Three years ago, is it today, Phyllis? Was it three years ago today, March 10th? She had a massive heart attack. This beautiful lady had a massive heart attack who ate right, had low cholesterol, low triglycerides, that I walk any man. She could do push ups, she could do everything, and she had a heart attack. And she's a walking miracle. And today, she's perfectly normal. She does everything that she used to do. And she's just as health conscious and got me eating the Mediterranean diet. Or trying. And I'm resisting. Because I figured if God did one miracle, he'll do a second miracle. No, I don't mean that. No. The point I'm trying to make is this, is that we will suffer, we will have difficulty, we will go through hard things. It does not mean that God does not love us. It does not mean that God doesn't care about us. It means that God trusts us with something that other people can't handle. And when you come through it, you need to praise Him. You have to praise Him in the good times and the bad times. He's the God of the mountain, and He's the God of the valley. I think about all the Bible characters that you read about. Even Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar looks in and he sees four people walking in the fire. The scripture never said we wouldn't be in the fire, but in the fire would always find God with us. Because he never leaves us nor forsakes us. See, Satan tempts us to believe that nothing bad will ever happen to Christians. Satan's lie lies so self-pity that blooms into bitterness of heart. That's why Satan wants you bitter at God. He'll tell you a lie that nothing bad happens. And here's what you'll say. Why me? Why me, Lord? I'm so good. Lord, don't you know I love you? Lord, I've been faithful. Lord, I've pastored your church. Lord, I've done this. Lord, I've done that. And Lord, why me? Nobody. Or you'll get to the place that... You'll go through something difficult and you think no friend loves you. You'll go church hopping. You'll go from place to place. That church doesn't love me. I'm suffering. Somebody said something bad about me. Somebody lied on me. Somebody helped ruin my reputation and I can't go there anymore. Poor me. I can't go to church. People won't forgive me. I can't go to church. I was bad. And I'm suffering, and nobody loves me, and I'm alone. Sound familiar? See, Satan wants you to be disheartened. Satan wants you to get to the place where he says you'll never have to suffer. It is tough. It is tough to come outside of sin and to renounce your sin and to admit that I did something wrong. That's not easy. But let me just say this, and listen closely. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if you've got anybody who is coming out of sin, you love them like you've never loved them. 
you embrace them. If they're coming out, that's victory for the Lord Jesus Christ, for God Almighty, and victory for you. Don't you judge them. Don't you turn them away. You embrace them, and you thank God that He's the God of the second chance and the third chance and the fourth chance because, see, you're just as guilty. Don't you push them away. Embrace them. Let them come in. Satan lies so that he'll sow that self-pity and it blooms into bitterness of heart. We've got to be careful that when people fall into this state of, of discouragement that we're there to help them. You look at the cross and you look real close, you'll see there is real suffering. Romans 8, 28 is still on the screen and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Line number four. Here's one that's going to shock you. Money does not bring happiness. And some of you are saying right now, well, just let me feel good then. Let me have a little more money. See, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. The love of money. Money's not bad. Money's good. Money is how we operate. Money runs churches. Money does good things for God's people. Money sends people to the mission field. Money takes care of pastors, keeps the lights on in the church. Money puts food on your table, gives you a place to stay. Money's not bad, will we all agree? But see, when we start to love money so much that it becomes our God and it becomes an idol to us, then we're in real difficulty. Matthew 4, 8, 9 says, Again, the devil took him upon exceeding high mountain Jesus and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, All these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you everything, the kingdoms of the world. And we know what happened. Jesus rebukes him with the word of God. In Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21, do not, let, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, but where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's okay to plan. It's okay to have investments. It's okay, okay to have nice homes. It's okay to have everything. But if you love money more than you love God, and don't let that go in this year and out real quick. Because there's, I mean, all I, got, I look at that camp board over there, and there are people in this church that could absolutely send every kid to camp if they wanted to. There are people in this church that I'll take a, I'll take a big piece of that to make the burden lighter. And I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just saying, boom, boom, there it is. Boom, there it is. Because, see, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. I'm going to let you in a little secret. When you die, ain't none of it going with you. Right? But, see, the love of money makes people want more money. They continue to do all these things and working hard, and they can't give God any time, but they're working hard to make more money. And they're building up, and their accounts are looking good, but they're on their last leg, many of them. Or they don't know what tomorrow holds. What are you going to do with it? Why not do some good with it now? Amen. Matthew six twenty four. No one can serve two masters, for either he'll love the one and hate the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. God be important. Money's a good asset. It's the means to the end. And the more, listen to me, the more, the more... God blesses you with, the more you should bless God with. And you won't lose it. You won't lose it. He's going to give it back tenfold, a hundredfold, and a thousandfold. For those who are truly successful in that arena, they'll all tell you everything they got because of God's blessing. Bless everything that they've done. Greed will take our focus off God. Listening to Satan will short-circuit God's plan. In Malachi chapter number 3, I'm doing really good on time. Malachi chapter, and I'm almost done. That's why I say I'm good, good on time. Malachi chapter 3, it, it, it's a really good verse that's in there. In Malachi chapter 3, let me share it with you. Well, let me start with verse number 8. Malachi chapter 3. Will a man rob God? Will peanut head man, goofy to the core man, man that God created, man that God blessed, the man that has fallen under the arm of God, <clears throat> a man that, that every day that he breathes is under the grace of God, man that has life by God, the man that God works miracles for, will he rob God? Does that not sound like an idiotic statement? 
Will he not bring man, rob God? Whoa. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? I didn't plan on doing this. The Holy Spirit said, do it. And tithes and offerings. And you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Try me now. Put me to the test. Just tithe. Just give. Just do what you do. And he says, and see if I don't open the windows of heaven. And pour out a blessing. So big, you can't receive it. I could call out a couple of individuals in this church, and they would amen this verse to the day. They would say, I have experienced this very thing that the Lord said. They put God to the test, and God has made them blessed far beyond they ever thought they would be. Brought them further than they ever thought they would be. It would embarrass them if I called their name, and you would say, wow. Wow. But the promises were not made just for them. It was made for everyone who would put God to the test. It's important. The rich young ruler, Matthew 19, 21, 22, Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had very great possessions. He couldn't give it up. He couldn't let God have what was rightfully God's. Think of the rich young ruler. For the rich people, and almost rich people, remember the words of Jesus. It's important that you understand this. He gives this dialogue of what this guy had done, and it was really great. Then he makes a, this following statement. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? It's important that you understand. The more money you get, the more money you will want. For people who have money, I've never seen people saying, I'm going to stop trying to make money. I want more money. Can't love it. It's a means to an end. Line number five, and I'm done. Everybody say amen. <laughs> and for those of you going to be baptized after this point, we will allow you to go to the back, right to my right. Just let me give you this point before you get up and move. This is, this is the real crux. If I had to pick out one of the five lives that's the biggest, this is it. Line number five, forgiveness is impossible. Forgiveness is impossible. That's the line of the devil. Some of you right now, some of your anxiety, some of your depression, some of your self-esteem issues, some of you not being able to find out who you really are in Christ are because of this lie. You believe that you can never be forgiven. That's what you believe. That God will never forgive you for what you did. And then Satan will tell you other people won't forgive you for what you did. Do you hear that hush? That hush that come across this room because it resonates with every one of us. It resonates with every one of us. 2 Corinthians 2.7 says, So that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. If you withhold forgiveness, and you believe God won't forget you, you'll be swallowed up with grief. Grief. You know what grief is? You ever seen a person lose someone? Grief is overwhelming. Grief allows them not to be who they are. Grief makes them not want to wake up in the morning. Grief makes them read their heart and gives them no hope. Grief overwhelms someone. And someone in sin, when we don't give them forgiveness that they need, or they try to get forgiveness, or they've done everything they can do to, to do that, he says, look what he says, they'll be swallowed up with too much sorrow, too much grief. The responsibility to forgive is huge. How would you feel if you thought God wouldn't forgive you? But see, the lie of the devil has said God is not going to forgive you. You were so rotten to the core. You did some awful things. And things can be awful. Can I get an amen? Every person in here, I can assure you, I'm telling you the truth. Every person in here, within the sound of my voice, wishes there was something they could take out of their past 
and they, they wish it had never happened. Can I get an amen? They wish they could have erased it away. They wish that, 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 that it would never come up in their mind. They wish that it would never be brought up again because it's too painful. See, when you repent with godly sorrow that really matters, you don't want anybody to bring the junk up again. The Bible says that when we confess our sin, that God cast our sin as far as the east is from the west and remembers it no more. God doesn't look at you because you're a sinner. God looks at you because you're a son or a daughter. And He doesn't remember your sin because your sin is not held to your account. Your account, your sin that was paid by Jesus Christ. And He covered you, even in your sin, even with all the negativity that comes with you, He covered you with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He imputed it to you. It's an imputation. You can read about it in Romans chapter 5 and 6. God gives you the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't look at you as one who has fallen into sin. What you did didn't shock Him. It grieved Him, but it didn't shock Him. And He, he loved you before you ever did it. He loved you as you did it, and He loves you now. And I, I find myself taken back why God's people who've experienced His forgiveness won't forgive other people. They won't do it. It's important that you understand. Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. Let me share something that I think will help you. Then Peter came to him and said, Let me use a little example in the chosen. Peter and Matthew didn't get along very well in the chosen. And the chosen is a what it could have been like behind the scenes. Understand, Matthew was a tax collector. He was a goodbye. A goodbye is the Greek term that identified him as a tax collector. There's a mokes and a goodbye. He worked for somebody else, but he made profit off God's people. Israel deemed tax collectors as the worst sinners of them all. And the question comes to Jesus. Peter comes and says, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? That was God's perfect number, seven. Seven days He created the world. I can give you all kind of history with numerically what the number seven means. It's God's special number. Should I forgive them seven times? Look what He says. Matthew 20, 18, 21, 22. And Peter came to Him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? He figured that was enough. That was, that was God's holy number. Seven times ought to be good enough, right? He offends me. He sins against me. I forgive him seven times. Jesus said to him, I did not say to you up to seven times, but to 70 times seven. 490 times. Not about a number. God's not keeping a number. He said, Peter, you're way off the boat, dude. Seven times? No, 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 no. No, no, no. He, he says it's seven times, 70 times. 490 times. There was a reason he said it. In 1 Kings 8, 16, the phrase, the phrase that is used is the phrase, the Hebrew word, tamion. The word tamion means complete, perfect, or finish. And it's used the first time in 1 Kings 8, 16. It's the phrase, let your heart be perfect. The word tamion is used 490 times. So when Peter comes to him and he, he says, Lord, how often should I forgive? And the Lord says 490 times under the alpha numeric system where you take the alphabet, the 490 times, if you look at the letters and the numbers, how they coincide, you will find that 490 times is the word that comes up, the word tamion. It means perfect or complete. A person that is supposed to forgive has no limit because the 490 times in the Hebrew goes back to an alphanumeric system that says that you have to forgive till you're whole or complete. Or in 1 Kings, as your heart is made perfect. Some people say, I forgive you, but they really don't. And they're incomplete. That word means that you will find completeness. 490 times. You will find completeness. You will find perfection. You will find Finished. In its definition, it means finished. Finished. So when it comes to forgiving, we don't have any choice 
if we want to be complete in God to forgive someone. You say, you don't know what they've done to me. You don't know what happened. I don't. I only know what God's Word says. I do know what the world did to Jesus. I do know that he was despised, rejected, spit upon, slapped, beaten, scourged, and he hung on a cross. I do know that he bore the sin payment for the whole world. I do know that. Isn't it amazing that on the cross, he makes this statement, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When you look at the word, again, that word forgiven, Tamion, the 490 times in the alphanumeric system forgiven, you know what Jesus said before he, after he said that, at the end of it, he said, hey, tell us that. It is finished. You know why it's finished? Because forgiveness was the main point of the cross. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, it's complete. The idea of forgiving one is complete, and the devil will tell you forgiveness is impossible. He will tell you that you can't receive forgiveness. He will tell you that you were too bad. Refusal to forgive invites bitterness into our hearts. Unforgiveness divides people and kills fellowship. And the road to forgiveness begins with remembering how much we have been forgiven. Now let me ask this. I, again, in point number two, I ask people to stand. Right now, if you feel, if you feel, any, you can come, but this has nothing to do with my invitation. If you feel right now that you are not forgiven, or someone has not forgiven you, or that you're having trouble forgiving someone, I want you to stand right now where you are. There's nothing, there's no shame. Holy moly. Leave the lights on for just this moment. If you feel like you have not been forgiven, maybe you feel that God has not forgiven you. Maybe you are struggling with forgiving someone else. Just stay standing. Let me just tell you, if your issue is with God, you can sit down because you're forgiven. You say, you don't know what I did. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter what you did. It only matters that your heart is broken and you know you've asked God to forgive you and I can assure you that His Word is true. He will not lie like Satan will. Satan will tell you God will not forgive you. But God will and has forgiven you if you repented of your sin. I'll quote a scripture to you, 1 John 1, 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to what? Forgive us and to cleanse us from all our lives. So is your, if your issue is right now that God will never use me, that God won't forgive me, that God hasn't forgiven me, it's a lie of the devil and you're believing a lie. And I'm telling you, the Word of God says you're forgiven. The Word of God says you're God's child. The Word of God says that you're saved and you're heaven-bound and hell-proof. The Word of God says Satan can't have you. The Word of God says that, that He knew you, He loved you when you committed your sin, and He's still loving you. His love is an everlasting love. The Bible says He loves us with an everlasting love. So if your issue is with God, you can sit down right now and claim the promises of God that God has forgiven you and you are free. Amen? And if you know the truth, you know the truth, not a lie, you'll be free indeed. You can sit down. If you're having trouble forgiving someone else, you hold the power right now to release that person. Because if you're not careful because you won't forgive them, you are putting them in a place of such sorrow that it may be like someone dying. It may be that it robs them of everything. If you don't forgive them, how can you not forgive them when your Heavenly Father has forgiven you? If it's somebody you need to call on the phone, I would advise you when you go home today, pick up that phone and call them and say, Look, I forgive you and I'm so sorry for not forgiving you. If that's someone you can go to and hug their neck, I would say you go to them and you weep and you say, I forgive you with all the fullness that I have. 490 times complete, whole, tamion, the Hebrew word, so that my heart will be perfect and I'll be complete in God. I forgive you for what you did or said. And if you're not being forgiven today, if you're not being forgiven, I want to pray for you right now. 
that whoever offended you, whoever hurt you, this is what I'm praying for. And, 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 and understand, they may never come to you. They hurt you. They hurt you. They may never come to you and say, forgive me. But I'm going to ask you to forgive them before they even come to you. Out of the condition of your heart. So that you can be complete. So that you can be whole. So that you don't have to believe the lie of the devil anymore. And you can be what God wants you to be. Pray with me right now. Father, I pray right now for every person who has not been forgiven. Every person who needs to forgive. And for every person, Father, who has believed the lie of the devil saying... God will never forgive you. Father, I claim victory for all three of these groups that are standing here right now. We have the power within ourselves to forgive. We have the power to say, I release you. We have the power to say, I love you again. We have the power to say that I'm sorry. And Father, we have the power to say, God, I am sorry that I failed to trust you when I should have. And I'm going to trust you now. I believe that you still love me and that you'll never let me go and that I'm forgiven. Father, I am so thankful for Jesus' words. It is finished. It is finished. Redemption and forgiveness is finished. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Now, if you're going to be baptized, I understand, you can go to this room right over here. Right through that door. Ryan's back there with some assistance. They're going to help you get ready for baptism. Okay? Baptism is a, an outward expression showing the world, I've received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm dying to the old life. I'm walking in new life. I don't care what the devil of the world says. I'm going to show you that I am following Christ, with, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. I told you I wasn't done with the invitation. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. You say, Pastor, I'm glad you're done. I am. That was a struggle, but I'm glad. It was some good information. It was good. There was some good news in that. There was some good stuff. Can I get an amen? Now we get to the hard stuff. The hard stuff is where every person has to look at himself because you'll lie to yourself. Because you've listened to the lies of the world, you listen to the lies of the devil, so now you'll lie to yourself and you'll say, I'm okay, and inside you're really not okay. You'll look at yourself and say, I know, deep down in the portals of my soul, I'm not ready to meet God. I know I'm a good person. I do good things. I'm likable. I'm religious. I, I, I do good stuff. But deep down, you know that you've never had a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You've never accepted Christ as your Savior. You know. But yet you'll put it off. You'll say, no, nah, it's just this feeling I got. No, nah, it's just, I'll be embarrassed. No, nah, I'll work through it. No, nah, I'll handle it. You understand, I'm, re I'm quoting some of the things that Satan would tell you. The lie that you're deity. No, I got this worked out. You can't work it out. You can't you can't forgive yourself of your sins. Only God can, and then you can claim the promise that God forgave you. You can't deny that that you've never had a relationship with God if you're not honest with yourself. You've got to you gotta be honest with yourself and say, I've never had it. Because, see, you'll lie to yourself and you'll say, I'm good, I'm good, I'm, I'm better than they are. You'll point your finger at somebody and say, well, look at them. I'm not as bad as they are. So here's the hard part of what we talked about today. All the things that Satan says falls down to this one thing. He doesn't want any of you in this building to claim Christ as your Lord and Savior. He doesn't want, he doesn't want any of you to say, I want to be saved. But I, I want to trust God. He'd rather you believe in the half lie that you're okay or that you get to heaven by being good. Good is a relative term, folks. What I seem as good, this little brother on the front may not see as good. 
It may not be what she says is good. It can't be that way. There's none good, no, not one. The Bible says, I either believe the Bible or I'm going to believe Satan. Satan's telling everybody they're good enough, they're good enough, they're, you're good enough, you're good enough. But yet we didn't do anything to pay our sin debt, only Christ did. And we'll lie and say, I don't need Jesus, I'm good enough. Here's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Here's how you rebuke Satan. Same way Jesus did. Be honest. And use the Word of God. Be honest and say, I don't think I'm really saved. I don't think I'm, I'm born again. I'm a good person. I'm an honest person. I don't steal. I don't cheat. But I've never made a decision to follow Christ. See, when you stand, you're not acknowledging you're the worst person in the world. You're acknowledging that you've never trusted Christ to get into heaven. Let me ask this question. Is there anybody in here today that said, I'm tired of lying to myself. I'm tired of being incomplete. I'm tired of not receiving the forgiveness of God. Because, see, you can't receive the forgiveness of God if you're not honest. God can do everything except lie. And He don't want you to lie to Him. He don't want you to lie in your spirit. Here's what I want you to do. If you're not sure if you're saved today, I want you to stand. As a matter of fact, I, I'm going to ask you not only to stand, but I'm going to ask you to come down and I want you to take my hand. I want you to come down to the front. If you're not, if you don't think you're saved, I want you to just, just stand where you are and come down here. And I want you to stand with me because I want to pray over you. Is there anybody like that today? Going to be honest. Search your heart. Your, your mind's reeling. You're hitting that little computer thing in your mind, right? Fast forward a little bit. Be honest. I'm not sure if I'm saved, but I want to be. I want to be. I want to trust God. I don't want to believe the lie of the devil anymore. If, you, if you're saying I want to be saved, look out of your seat. Come on down with me. Give me a hug. I'll give you a hug. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor Jacob, would you come over here and help me? You're a good brother, man. You're a good person. You're in our military. You're going to be a first sergeant. You're protecting us from riffraff. You got a good wife. You're a good daddy. But he says, I'm incomplete. I need to be saved today. He's not a bad person. This is one of my favorite people. And he's going to follow the Lord today. I'm going to ask you this question. Do you believe God forgives you? Amen. That is so good. Don't listen to lies of the devil. God loves you. Just pray that prayer of assurance for Pastor Jacob. I promise you, I promise you, heaven's yours. It was made just for you, those that are honest. Amen. I'm glad you and I are going to spend eternity in heaven, my brother. Amen. God bless you. Amen. You pray with Pastor Jacob. Is there another one? Do you realize how hard that is for a military guy that's serving right now on the border protecting us? He made a profession of faith a little while ago, but it was kind of a head knowledge thing, not a heart thing. I didn't know anything about that, but I, I can tell when a person is not sure, that means the first time they made have a decision in their head, not in their heart. Is there someone else? That pastor, I'm tired of playing the game. I'm tired of lying to myself. I want to trust Christ. Anyone else? Anyone else? You see how easy that was? Hugs, kisses, embrace, all those things. Amen. Brothers and sisters, just loving God, doing what they need to do. Nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to rebuke you. Nobody's going to preach to you. Nobody's going to tell you how bad you were. And nobody's going to say, I can't believe it. You know why? Because we've all been there. We're going to rejoice. The Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents. Is there anyone else that said, I'd like to follow Christ here this morning? Not sure if I'm saved. Praise the Lord. Miss Phyllis, I need your help. God bless you. How are you? Amen. I am so glad you're honest with yourself. You want to receive Christ as your Savior this morning? You want to know for sure? Yeah. Okay. My wife is going to pray with you about the assurance of your salvation. Amen. And let me just tell you this. God is glad you came because He wants you to have a clear mark, uh, mind and a clear heart. And He wants you to walk around full of joy and no doubt this morning. Amen. Pray with my wife, Phyllis. All right? God is moving. God is speaking as to someone else.
This is a good thing, folks. Why in the world you don't want to listen to the devil? You don't listen to what God's Word says. Full of grace, full of truth. Jesus Christ came full of grace and truth. Anyone else? I keep walking to this side because I believe God is speaking to someone over here. I don't, I don't know what God does and how He does it. I just know He speaks to every heart. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You're not, you, you, you're not saying that you're just this awful individual. You're just saying, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of no peace, no hope. I'm tired of not being sure if I die today and what's for me. And let me just say this. Hell is as real as heaven is real. Is there anyone else before I close? Anyone else? I don't control it. The Holy Spirit controls it. All right, everybody else is standing good. Either you're telling the truth or you're telling a lie. Amen? Search your heart. Let's do this. Let me pray one more time. And I'll offer one more opportunity because I believe there's some people holding back. Their palms are sweaty. They're shaking. They're nervous. They're embarrassed. And church, let's just pray that all of that be taken away and they just give their heart to Christ this morning. Let's pray. One more opportunity. Pray. Father, I pray for every person in this building. I pray for the honesty of their heart for the because their soul is at stake. Their soul is at stake. Father, I pray that they would not be worried about embarrassment, they'd not be ashamed, they'd not be fearful, they'd not, not feel like they're being judged, but they just feel the grace and comfort of God Almighty Himself. Speak the hearts that need to make that decision to follow Christ or find assurance for their salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anyone else? That prayer was for you. Amen. I don't see anybody coming. I'm going to close. Because see, it's on you now. It's on you. Give the Lord a hand clap if you would. I do believe we're going to have some baptisms right now. Ryan, why don't you come on out, bud? You got your helper with you, I see. What a, what a good picture. Ebony, come here a minute. Bring, bring your stuff. No, no, bring it up. Bring it on here. Look here. Her daddy's fixing to do some baptizing. And she's here to help her daddy. That's so good. You're so pretty. You helping daddy and helping all these be baptized? Isn't that so good? Go right over there. See, he's training up this young child while she's young and the way that she'd go. When she's older, she's going to say, yeah, I used to help my daddy baptize people. I used to help in the church. We put a lot of people under the water. Some we held under longer than others. Amen. So, Ryan, what you got? Ryan it heads up our deacon body doing the baptizing this morning. What do we got here? We have uh, three young ladies. Three young ladies. It's a special circumstance when you have young people uh, committing themselves to the Lord and following uh, the obedience to the baptism. So, uh, it's a special thing. All of them are special. But how many of us? Savior, 
just make this decision? Did he just make that decision today? Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, all of you, for being so patient during the time. Don't believe the lies of the devil. And and the junk you're hearing on TV, remember, it's satanic. It is demon-driven. And we need to take everything that we hear and measure it toward the Word of God. Let that be our standard and not what the TV says. Amen. God bless you. Love you guys.